news from the universe for February 2017. Our top story tonight, only the shadow knows. The older folks in the audience get this, okay? The young kids like you, no, you have no idea what I'm talking about, all right. But maybe, maybe you still won't have an idea after I'm done with this, but it's all right. <laughs> so what we're talking about here um, is this amazing, oh, can we kill the, the front, the down can lights? This is, a, we, need, we need darkness on, 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 the, on the screen here. There we go. The ones that are shooting down on top of me, just kill those. I, nobody needs to see me, okay? Just, uh, they need to see the screen. All right, so this is absolute amazing image. This is TW Hydra. This is a disk of material around a, uh, a um, almost sun-like star. It's a 0.8 solar mass star here, okay? TW Hydra. And this is a disk of material around this young star. This star is about 10 million years old. And what you see in this disk, you also see grooves, sort of like a phonograph grooves, which, of course, the kids don't know either, but... <laughs> Uh, these are gaps in the disk around it. And this is from the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, otherwise called ALMA down here. Um, and using millimeter wavelengths, they're able to see disks of material around these young stars. And in these disks are where we expect planets to form, okay? So we're getting amazing views of planetary systems in formation not only from Hubble, but also from the, this, this millimeter array. And they were able to get the highest resolution ever of a planet, protoplanetary disk um, when they looked on the interior, and they tell me they're seeing details as small as one astronomical unit. And one astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and Earth, okay? So they're getting resolution of another solar system down to the scale of the sun-Earth distance. This is really, really cool, okay? So Alma has been doing some amazing things. They released another one that was really wonderful, TL, um, uh, HL Taw, is it called? Oh, I can't, yeah, HL Taw, uh, HL, HL Tori, which, which blew our minds. This one is even a little bit, because it's a little closer, it's actually slightly higher resolution, all right? Uh, they also were able to, last September, announce that they had evidence that there might be a Neptune-sized planet inside this gap. There's a gap here that's about 22 astronomical units away from the center, from the star. Uh, Neptune, by the way, is 17 astronomical units. And that there might, due to the characteristics of the dust, there might be a Neptune's uh, mass planet. They don't, can't say for sure, all right? Uh, so TW Hydra is a really interesting system, okay? Matter of fact, one astronomer said this. TW Hydra is quite special is the nearest known protoplanetary disk to Earth, and it may closely resemble our solar system when it was only 10 million years old. Now that's some cool stuff to study. So of course, lots of people have been studying it, okay? And Hubble has, has looked at it. Here is Hubble's image from 2016 up against the ALMA image. Now I do this on, on, uh, on purpose to show you that we're so used to Hubble having the best resolution, right? Well, it has the best resolution of any visible light telescope. When you go out to these large radio arrays, which can be huge and spread across multiple dishes across kilometers, they can actually get better resolution than Hubble can. So the millimeter array of ALMA actually has better resolution than Hubble does. Um, but Hubble is, of course, looking in visible light, they're looking in millimeter. And so Hubble has been looking at this for several years, trying to determine, do we have evidence of planets in formation in uh, TW Hydra? All right? Well, here is a 2015 image, and here's a 2016 image. And the astronomers who've been studying this for years noticed that there's sort of a darkish region here, and then there's also a darkish region over here. So they specially processed it to try and pull out the contrast to see those darkish regions. And what they found was that this darkish region here sort of rotated uniformly across to here. Now, the idea here is that it doesn't depend upon distance from the star, right? If it were something in orbit, okay, then it would depend on the distance from the star. It's moving uniformly at many different distances. Okay, and that it stretches out across here 
um, and it's got a period of about 16 years, okay? If, if you just take this motion over the, over the course of one year and extend it out, it would actually rotate all the way around the star in about 16 years, right? That can't be something out at this 60, 70 AU distance. It has to be in something really, really in close. So what they think they are seeing is the shadow of a tilted disk down in the center a shadow across the outer disk from a tilted disk in the center. And here's an artist's illustration of that. Oop. Oh, I'm using the wrong clicker. <laughs> there we go. All right. So this is not the scale. This, this would be a disk way down deep, around 1 AU in size, OK? Um, and if there were a planet tugging on that, et cetera, with that to pull it out, out of alignment, then the shadow from that disk probably not as tilted as shown here in this artist's illustration, um, would actually extend across the outer disk. And as the, it, it, if there's a planet there to precess that disk, okay, as that disk precesses over 16 years, that shadow will move across the outer disk. All right? Again, this is, a, uh, this is an explanation based upon the data. We don't have proof of this yet because even Alma can't see down below 1, one AU. All right, so this is the sub supposition is that there is a 1AU, but it gives us something really cool to shoot for um, in this nearest of protoplanetary disks. So who knows what planets lurk in the heart of TW Hydrae? <laughs> Only the shadow knows. <laughs> yes, I really said that. <laughs> All right, number two, our second story tonight a smidge or two of dust gas and star formation. So when I talk about smidge, it's in capitals, so you know it's uh, one of these science acronyms. And this, this science acronym stands for the Small Magellanic Cloud Investigation of Dust and Gas Evolution. <sighs> yes, we scientists come up with some tortured acronyms, but you know, it helps us be able to differentiate our projects. All right, so this is the Small Magellanic Cloud, okay? Um, and you can see some bright gas in here, these red little uh, nebulae. Those are bright gaseous regions, okay? And you can see that gas. But what about the gas you can't see, all right? And it's really important, that gas that you can't see, all right? The gas and dust in these galaxies changes our views, and we want to understand it. We want to be able to characterize it, all right? So how would you see the dust in this room? There you go. All right, you might be able to see the dust in a room in a sunbeam, right? This is a dusty workspace, and you can see that if I look over, if I look most anywhere through the room, I'm not seeing the dust. But the sunbeams come through the windows, and I can, and it illuminates the dust. What's actually happening is the dust is scattering the light of the star. The star happens to be our sun. The same thing is happening in the small Magellanic Cloud. The light from the stars in the SMC is getting scattered by the dust in the SMC, and actually the blue light is scattered more than the red light, so the red light preferentially is let through. This produces something we call reddening in astronomy. So the stars appear a little bit redder due to the scattering due to dust, and the amount of that reddening tells us how much dust there is. So this is what the Smidge project is doing. They're using Hubble to examine this region, which looks small, but it's actually really large for Hubble, um, to examine this region inside the small Magellanic Cloud to try and measure the reddening. All right, so here are the, uh, the geek diagrams. Um, here you can see that it's a lot of pointings of Hubble, right? Here are all the various pointings of Hubble. Um, and they're using seven different band passes from the uh, near ultraviolet through visible light all the way into the near infrared many different band passes. And the reddening has a certain spectral signature across those various band passes, so they're able to pull that out and separate it out from other effects to truly understand this. Now you say, okay, well, who cares how much dust is in the SMC? Well, it's really important because we use the SMC, the nearby galaxies, as a proxy for trying to estimate how much dust are in the distant galaxies we, we observe. So this is a standard for all the other studies that we can't do this on, right? So the Smidge project is going to get us some really good measurements of reddening in a nearby galaxy and will help improve our observations of all the other galaxies. Now you may ask me, well, what are the science results of Smidge? 
and they haven't come out yet. Um, this press release that I'm going to talk about today was actually done in December, and the first results came out a little bit at the AAS meeting in January. So the press release wasn't even on the results of Smidge, but I thought it was really cool that you should know about how astronomers do these big projects with Hubble and what they do them for. The press release itself, well, it was actually to go into the Small Magellanic Cloud, and let me play the movie. All right, so in the constellation of Hydrus, we go into, into the small Magellanic Cloud, and this is a dwarf galaxy around the, the um, Milky Way. It's a satellite of the Milky Way. And we're going to zoom in, and we're paging through various data sets, and now we get to the Hubble data set, finally, and zoom in, and what we find is this gorgeous nebula here. And so that's what our press release was actually about in December. Um, as you may remember, we always do a July 4th fireworks press release. We always do a December holiday lights press release. This was our holiday lights press release, our festive lights. But as I said, it's a smidge or two because this is not, this is the, um, this is the nebula NGC 248, but it's not as actually a single nebula. One of the cool features of this is it actually has one H2 region, star formation region up here, and another star formation region down here that happen to be lying along the same line of sight from our view. And they appear as if they are a single nebula, but it's actually two star forming regions. I don't know if they're actually connected, um, but they're very close along the line of sight of NGC 248. So although I started off talking about dust and everything, this is really just a talk about the, um, this, the press release was really just a pretty picture release of the, hol the uh, holiday festive lights uh, from NGC 248, our pretty picture for December 2016.